I just needed to get formalized training and eating right um, and sleeping. And I worked with some great, fantastic coaches that really taught me the value of routine. So every morning I get up, every single morning I work out and do something. I like to get outside, even if it's cold. In, we're in the Midwest, even if it's cold, I'd like to go for a walk or a run or just do some type of physical activity because I know the importance of just doing that as part of a daily routine. Welcome to another episode of Better Business, Better Life. Today, I am joined by Brent Polman, who is not only the CEO of Miss Midwest Laboratories, but also an author of the book, Leaders Look Within. And I'm very pleased to have Brent in the studio. I've been reading. He's got the CEO of the Heart website, which really appeals to me. So I'm really looking forward to our talk. Welcome to the show, Brent. Thank you, Deborah. It's, it's a pleasure to be here. And I'm excited to, uh, to tell the story and uh, answer your questions. Yeah, I'm looking forward to it. So um, for those of you who don't know Brent, Brent is actually the CEO of what is actually a family business, a second generation family business. And of course, the author of The Leader Within. Uh, look for the Leader Within. Can you just tell us a little bit about your story, Brent, and tell us uh, how you got to where you are today and, and what's happened on that journey? Sure. Uh, Deborah, uh, as you said, uh, I am the CEO of Midwest Laboratories. Uh, we have about 278 employees and we are in the verticals of human health, animal health, and agricultural and environmental type of testing. So we do uh, what I tell people is we're not the research type of lab, but we are the production type of lab where we test your food, we test your water, we test your soil, but in large uh, volumes. Uh, farmers, for, exa uh, for example, after harvest, they'll send their soil samples in for that last application and we'll get anywhere from 20,000 to 30,000 samples a day. And then we turn results wow. up in three to five days. Uh, pet food and feed, we get about 1,000 to 2,000 samples a day. And again, we get results out in three to five days. So it really takes a well-oiled machine here at the lab to do not only testing, but look at it as a production uh, piece and uh, really operate on high quality and get, get that those answers and that data out to clients. Um, mm -hmm. I came back to the business, uh, background on me. Um, I grew up in the lab during high school, college, and then my dad told me that after college that I needed to go away and get some professional experience. So I, I taught high school for a while. I taught, um, uh, I went to, uh, um, I got my master's in business and then worked at other um, corporations. And then I came back in 2005 as the marketing director. And then in 2016, my dad and I, after his two partners retired, we worked together for five years. He retired at the age of 80 at in 2020. And, um, and that was again, another really good experience for me to work directly with my father for those years. And now, now I really want to build on his legacy. And uh, we are doing that we have grown um, exponentially over the last four years, we went from 130 employees in 2019 to as I said, 278 today. Wow. So um, that's fantastic. And we never closed during COVID and we stayed open and that's a whole another story. But um, yeah, the, how I got to where I was, um, it's been, it, it was probably a rocky road up until about three or four years ago. And then that's when it really hit that you really, I really had to do something about the leadership piece and what did that all mean? And that's really where the book came from. And so I'm really okay. excited about, to tell this story because I think there's a lot of leaders out there that are trying to find themselves and not only just leaders, but people in general, just trying to find themselves and, and discover a strong why and why do they get up every single day? And when you find the power of that, um, it can really be transformational. And that's what I'm excited about. That's why I want to share this story because it's, it's huge. It can make a huge difference in the lives of people. Absolutely. I think we're on the same page. I mean, I think that, you know, we spend, life is too short and we really should be doing what we love with people we love. And people are the key, right? Oh, um, surround yourself with the right people, support the right people. You're going to get the results you want. But tell us a little bit about, so tell us about the book. What, where did the book, um, I, I hope where the idea come, came from, but what is, what is the book all about? So the book, again, is really um, my journey um, on leadership. Um, I mean, Who's to say myself, it sounds very selfish that I, I get to write a book on leadership. I mean, it does sound like a really selfish act, but what I really learned through that is that leadership is very individualistic. 
that each one of us comes at leadership so differently and we have to find it in our heart. I mean, it's, it's here. I mean, it's just definitely in our hearts. And to get there, that was probably the story for me. I had to do three things. First, I had to look inside my heart and see what's in there. What currently, how did I, just like your question here, how did I get to where I am today? Um, what things were impactful? What things do I still need to, that I have in here that I needed to deal with? And discover really only myself. And through that process, then you start to, uh, the, your beliefs, your set of values really come to light when you start to do that piece. Second, um, I needed some self-care big time. I thought self-care was selfish. Right. That was my whole phrase. <laughs> I thought people who dealt with that was the really were out there. But you really do. If you're going to really become a leader, you have to take care of yourself. And you've got to, I say, I want to bring my A game every single day. And the only way I can do that is uh, healthy wise, that I do things that are healthy, that I take care of my body. And at the same time, that's not only uh, physically, but spiritually uh, from a faith standpoint, all those things together, I had to get more healthier. And that was the second part. And then finally, living a life of gratitude. Um, my, my why, my how statement is I'm a person of faith who coaches people up and leads from the heart. And that's what really, when you have a heart for people, when you wake up every single day and you're grateful for what you've been given, you can just start, start from there and you can really build on that. And there's several ways we'll get into, um, I'm sure in this interview, but that again was the premise of the book that I discovered all these things that were really inside of me that I didn't realize I needed to uh, find for myself so that again, I could be an effective leader um, and work. And I have to work at it every single day as well. But th that's the premise of the book. That's really the premise of uh, the last few years. So I really just really talk about the last few years and this huge transformation. And so was there a sort of a turning point or something that happened that kind of made you realize that you had to do something? Because you've mentioned, you know, finding your why, getting healthy, having gratitude. Was there anything that kind of caused you to really look for that was there a turning point? Yeah, you know, I, I would say several things, but probably one of the key things was my mom passing away uh, from cancer. She died of cancer five years ago. And that really, Sorry I didn't realize how how hard that really affected me. And I remember a few days after she died, I said, you know what, I want to be more, in I said, <laughs> I said this in a prayer, I help me to be more intentional about my faith. I had no idea what I was saying there. But that intention was just somehow started with that by making that statement. Um, and there's a cool story in the book, I'll tell you, I'll tell you one example. Um, so my, my mom had passed away in August, her birthday was in November. I didn't want my dad to uh, be alone. So we went to this conference and we entered this coffee shop and on this, in this coffee shop on the wall was this chalkboard that said, how can we pray for you? And I thought, oh my gosh, mom is talking to me. My mom had thousands of prayer journals. I started to read some of them, uh, my sister and I have, and it's been just fascinating to see who she prayed for and how prayers were answered. And so now if you come into our main entrance, we have a prayer wall in our main office here because it's a way of saying, hey, we, uh, if you're a customer, if you're an employee, anybody can put something up there and know that yeah. they're being prayed for. And I think that's so, in, in, um, I just think it just speaks to the volume of care that we have uh, at our company. And it's just non-invasive, it's just there. And I don't promote it or anything, it's just there. It's always there, that's anybody beautiful. can do it. Yeah. Okay. I'm sorry to hear about your mum. I had a similar situation. My mother passed away from cancer as well. So it can be a real um, eye opener, can't it, in terms of what are we doing? Why are we doing it? What's it all about? Yeah. Yes. Yeah, absolutely. Tell me, a little, tell me a little bit about the health side, because it's one of the things that I know. So I love my business, and so I often find myself, you know, struggling with that whole mm -hmm. oxygen mask concept of looking after myself first. I'm very much focused on it right now um, because I realized I've gotten to a point where it had taken a, a, a back seat, if you like, and it wasn't really serving me. So tell me a little bit about your, yeah. your health. Oh, uh, I mean, physically, I mean, back, I can go back to 2007. I was falling asleep at my desk. Um, I was very reactive there. Were, there were, I was at marketing at that point, but I remember going home and I told my wife, I said, I just, I'm going to go to the hospital. I think something's up with me. I don't, my right, my whole side is numb. Something's up. Whoa. So I go in the hospital. They say, everything's fine. You should just go home. I said, wait, no, I don't think so. And they said, well, you can do a stress test or you, or we can go up with a camera and look inside your house. I said, I think you need to do that. 
Sure enough, there was an artery that was 98% blocked. And uh, I, I had a stent that night put in, into me. Yeah. But that was my first wake up call to health. Right. And uh, at that time, I was probably drinking probably about 12 pack of Diet Pop every single day, um, energy yeah. drinks. I mean, you'd, I was on caffeine like um, all the time. Like an IV drip. I almost. came to work every, early. I think, I don't know about you, but I think I know when I worked in the corporate world, it was all about going in early, staying late, putting in all the time in the world if you were going to move up in the company. I mean, think about today's world. That is not, I don't, I think that's, I don't even know if it's that way at all today, but that's the way I just remember in 2000, 2010. I mean, you, you just did those in the nineties. Yep. That's how you moved up. Is you were just you were doing more work than anybody else, and it probably took a physical toll. I know it did. Um, but back to your self care, yes, I work with a trainer every single day, or I shouldn't say every single day, twice a week. Um, but I think I knew something. I just needed to get formalized training and eating right um, and sleeping. And I worked with some great, fantastic coaches that really taught me the value of routine. So every morning. I get up every single morning. I work out and do something. I like to get outside, even if it's cold. Yeah. In, we're in the Midwest. Even if it's cold, I like to go for a walk or a run or just do some type of physical activity because I know the importance of just doing that as part of a daily routine. Um, and I've learned other things along the way. Um, I track my energy. I wear one of these. I don't know if you've heard the WHOOP, W-H-O-O-P. It measures yeah. your energy. So I know how, okay. if I had a good night of sleep, like last night, I did not have yep. a good night of sleep. So I might okay. tend to be a little more reactive. So I, I check those numbers and then it just helps yep. me manage who I am so I can bring my best self all the time. Yeah. And I think that's we, the, I have an, an hour okay. ring, which yeah. I think is probably something similar that is the same thing. It me measures your sleep. It measures your heart rate. It tells you your oxygen saturation, those sort of things. And it is really fascinating because I, um, I've actually been sleeping really well now for the last few years. And that has made a huge difference. Uh, being really conscious about sleep hygiene, turning off devices an hour before bed and all those sort of things is, uh, yeah, it's, um, it's amazing what effect a lack of sleep can have on you. Mm -hmm. No, Absolutely. Yeah. And the same with the walking. I mean, I think I get, it's interesting. I used to, so I run a lot of client sessions throughout the week and they usually start about eight o'clock. So I wasn't getting up early enough to do my walk before my sessions. And of course the, the sessions are actually when you, I need the most energy and I need to be the, feeling the best. And so I actually adjusted things to get up really early and actually go for a walk, even when it's dark. Yeah. Um, and just that, that simple half an hour extra to get up and do that walk for half an hour just makes such a huge difference to the way the day go, pans out. It does. It does. It's amazing yeah. once you get in a routine of that. Absolutely. Hmm. I'm going to go back a little bit now to the family business because I'm, I'm, I'm a business, family business advisor and I'm always fascinated by family businesses, particularly, you know, second, third, fourth generation. Did you really want to work in the business or was it something that was almost thrust upon you? No, um, we had a deal. Like I said, my dad and I had a deal when I came out of college. He really pushed that I go out and discover the corporate world, do some teaching, do, do other things. And he was so right. I think if I would have come back to the business at that time, I would have always wondered what was on the other side. When I came right. back, though, what I didn't expect was one of the other partners had had three sons in the business, too. So oh. there was a little competition going on. Everyone was, you know, everyone was like vying for who was what's going to happen. Uh, we worked and we worked together and things. But um, I would just say. I think I needed to see that. And I had all kinds of ideas. Like I, I wanted to implement a bunch of ideas when I first came on and I was like told, mm, no, this is why these, this is the way it's been. And, and I couldn't, I couldn't disagree because my dad had built this fantastic company, uh, managed costs and it was growing. So, and it was his company. So, I mean, who am I to say anything? So I, there was this total respect to learn the business. Um, but I think what it really, I think what it really showed me is I, I kept asking myself, do I have this entrepreneurial spirit? Because you really do have to ask that if you're going to take even anybody taking over a family business. Do you want to own this? Is this really you? Yeah. Um, I I own it to such a point. I will never sell. I don't care what the price tag is. Oh, wow. I, okay. I know the day I sell it, it's not the same company anymore. So that's what drives me. And to say, I want to build again on my father's legacy and pass it down to another generation. All those calls every single day that I get on those those things, they can, you know, I ignore most of them um, yeah. and maybe respond to a few, but I'm just saying it's not worth it because I know the culture will be different. I know the company will be different. 
And there's something about growing a culture and putting people first. When you put people first, you go farther, faster than anything. Um, I talk in the book about people, process, and technology, and in that order, and it is so true, yes. and it's so rewarding uh, for everyone when you have that uh, you have that in place in your company. We actually teach people a bit, very much around those things as well. And, you know, people, it's about having the right people who share your core company values, who are, you know, absolutely part of the family. Tell me a bit about how did you go about creating the culture? Because you have grown pretty quickly, right, from 130 to 278 people. And it can be difficult to maintain culture. I'd love to hear a little bit about how oh, yeah. you do that. Um, I mean, I've made mistakes too. I mean, that you, do, you learn. I brought in some of the people I thought were going to be be good fits, but I think I, I based it on their experience to your point. I don't know if I at the values really aligned correctly, but today I'm, I'm so fortunate. I have a um, chief strategy officer, Dana, that um, she is so brutally honest with me about everything. Um, she basically told me, I will never forget like three years ago, she said, she said, Brent, you have to get out of the day to day operations. We need you on the strategic. We already. need you to be on the strategic side. We need a new campus. We need this. We need this. Let us handle the operations. We need you to be the leader. People need to see where the company is going. People need to see that um, that there's a direction here. And I think about it. My dad was in the operations his whole life. I don't know if he ever oh, got out of the operations. I think that's why it was so hard for him to leave the, the business, at, and he finally did at the age of eighty. But uh, I. I kind of, I, I really think that was part of the reason because he didn't know where the company was going. He felt like being here and, and to an extent, there was some protection in that, but also I know now as I'm not in the operations, I got to get out of the way. i can be the biggest roadblock sometimes. Um, and I have to really watch that. I don't go back into the operations because it gets really, it gets a little weird if I start to do that, or I start questioning things and I have a great team in place. I and mean, that's where the growth really came was, uh, Dana brought on these directors and um, really grew the business. And she invests so much of her time coaching people up. She's a, her and I are have the same like disc profile. It's kind of scary, but um, we're both like ISs and we just both love the coaching piece. Mm -hmm. But it takes a lot of investment in people and it takes a lot of coaching and time. And to find someone like who is ready, who's willing to do that, that you can always trust. I mean, she's phenomenal. She is. So definitely That's great. that whole process and bringing our directors together. We have now we have scientists who want to go on and get their uh, masters in business. I never thought I'd see the day that that shift would happen because science scientists are a little more, much more analytical on that side than they are on the people side, but it's been great yes. to see this growth and see the change and dynamic happen. Mm -hmm. So how do you make sure when you're bringing people into the business that they actually will fit within your culture? What is the, the process? That you I think, about? you know, the, on the onboarding, I think it's definitely the core values. We see those core values at our town halls as we meet as a whole company, or you can, you can attend live, you can attend virtually. I think that's really the key. Um, again, I, I will say putting people first, that has to happen. Um, it's pretty obvious when somebody isn't aligned with the core values, it really rises to the top. It didn't used to, we used to hide that or is it, let's not talk about mm -hmm. so-and-so that's not how, you know, if they're not acting or they're doing things that are a little bit out of character, um, we always go back to the core values and what's what we stand for. And it, it brings up direct conversations. We used to not have any direct conversations a few years ago, but we do, we want to correct people and we give them the opportunity to change. And if they don't, you know, we'll help them find their next job. You know, that we're here to help you. If it's not a good fit here, let's help you find what's a good fit for you if you move on from here. I think that's one of the challenges is that as leaders, we, we um, people feel like they have to manage people, but actually as leaders, we're there to create the opening and actually allow them to rise up. And our job is to, as you said, either say, how can we help you to, to get to that? Or um, if you're not happy here, it's okay if you want to go somewhere else and we can help you with that because everybody should be loving what they're absolutely. doing um, and loving who they're working with, yeah. right? No, absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. Okay. And so people, process, technology. Let's talk a little bit about process, shall mm -hmm. we? <laughs> what do you mean by okay. process, first um, of all? We had, I mean, we've been around for 48 years. So uh, we had a lot of head knowledge here. And a lot of head knowledge came and went. And a lot of things did not get documented down. 
Uh, we have since in the last five years put together even a quality team that reviews our, our methods. We have over 3,000 uh, test analytical test methods that we are constantly reviewing. Um, our supervisors, our directors, when they're managing people, we we go over how to do an effective review. All these things that pro when a, a client or a new person walks in the door, here's the, here's the here's your sheet. Follow these things. We want consistency around uh, the deliverable of our uh, analysis and our reports, and just again working together. There's just a dynamic mm -hmm. there. If you have processes that are documented that you can refer to. Um, I think that really helps create a consistent culture um, versus if someone's walking around or has all this knowledge, and then, like I said, they walk out the door, then what do you do with that? How do you, how do you recover from that? So training others, uh, obviously those, those types of actions, but I really think it starts with just documenting processes and that gets really overlooked a lot. I agree. And I think probably as entrepreneurs, we, we t I mean, I used to think I hated process. I was like, oh, no, I don't like process. I much prefer the bigger picture stuff. But um, I actually realized that we, we do do it as entrepreneurs anyway, because we normally see an opportunity and we work out how to deliver on the opportunity. What we don't do so much is actually get it out of our heads onto paper in a way that is actually palatable for other people too, because um, so I'm, I'm half German and the way that I tend to approach things is very methodical. And I'm also a biochemist by trade. So I actually worked in pathology of my first years of my life um and yeah it's it you know the way that i do things is actually quite different to the way other people do things so working together as a team to go hey here are the outcomes that we need to produce this is what um you know where the, the journey that they go through and having them involved in developing that process is really important mm -hmm. isn't it? oh yeah absolutely absolutely yeah and how do you stop it from becoming, you know, because people go, oh, but if I make it all very process oriented, we'll become another McDonald's where it's always like, oh, would you like fries with that? Which, yeah. um, you know, it feels inauthentic and very um, almost robotic. No, I, I think that's a perfect um, example, too, because I, I used to think that that's how too many pro you could have too many processes. I don't know if you could ever have too many processes. But I think the other level of this that leaders bring to the table in this that we're trying to instill even in our directors is the building of awareness with other people. Um, it's so simple as calling each other by our names. I mean, with COVID, when we grew from 130 to 278 people, I, I lost track of people's names. And it's only been in the last couple of months I met with every single department. And I really, I didn't talk work. I just said, one of my questions was, tell me something about you that nobody else in this room knows about you. And then the second part of that was you can ask me any question about the business, me, myself. And we did it as a group setting, but oh my goodness. I mean, the answers came through, but I had to really reconnect with people. And I really wanted to hear, I, they had to tell me their name and when they started. I couldn't believe people had been here already three years and probably this was their first conversation with me here at the, the company. Because we do want to keep that small family atmosphere together with this as we yeah. continue to grow. But you got to call people by their name. It's got to be personal. It's got to show that we're building again. You know, if, if I see somebody coming in and I see something kind of off or this person's usually small and they're down, all you have to say, hey, is everything going OK? Or you see some behavior in a meeting that is really contrary. Now I just ask, I say, hey, is something happening? I'm much more aware. I used to not think like that, but I think that's so important today in today's world because I, I think so many people are going through so much over the last few yeah. years. Yeah, I always say that sometimes, you know, when we, we look at sort of a people analyze and look at the core values and we, we always measure them, you know, are they are they mostly doing it? Are they a bit um, flip-flopping, I like to call it? If they're flip-flopping, it's usually because there's something going on. It, it's not deliberate. They're not trying to be, um, you know, naughty or trying to sort of upset people, but they've just got something going on in their personal lives. And you're right. There is just so much going on in the world these days. You've got to really yeah. take the time to understand right. what's going but on. But the scary them. thing for me was I used to be like hundred percent reactive. Like I didn't put oh, up really? with that kind of stuff or I was the same way. If somebody would say yeah. something, I'd just be short and I never thought about it. I never even thought about how my <laughs> actions were coming yeah. across to others. Yeah. So it's really turned the key through, through this getting healthier. And again, having a respect for other, others and putting people first. It really does. Mm. It is life changing. 
And I think it's it, you have to slow down, don't you? I mean, I move at a, at a wickedly fast pace. I speak too fast. I think too fast. And often I have to go, <gasps> breathe, <laughs> slow down. Yeah, don't be reactive. But, yeah. I mean, how how do you teach yourself if it's not a natural skill? So, I mean, I'm quite fortunate. I'm a biochemist by trade, but I don't think I ever was really a biochemist. It was just one of those mistakes I made in life because <laughs> I love people. Yeah. But um, if you're not naturally a people person uh, or, or you find yourself becoming a, a non people oh, person what could you do to, to reconnect i think my employees laugh at me today in meetings because they know that yeah. i they know how react some of the people who have been here long enough know how reactive i used to be so if you right. see me in a meeting to your point i will i'll take like a huge deep breath uh, someone will say like um i think we should i think i deserve more pay than this person or something you know that's like okay uh yeah i have to i just have to really just collect my thoughts what i'm doing and people ask are you okay and i just say no i'm just processing and aura and the other word that i've used and, and um in the past i've said you know what i i will even slow down i'll just say you know what i'm a little uncomfortable right now but let's talk about that tomorrow if you use the word uncomfortable what i've done now every single day is i look at the whole day and i say what made me uncomfortable today um and then i write it down and typically when I write it down, then I've, I've already taken the step to just say, I got to decide, is this something that is a priority? Is this something that can wait? Is this something that needs to be dealt with? But in the moment, it really made me uncomfortable. Why did it make me uncomfortable? Maybe it was triggering something from my past. Maybe it, but the word uncomfortable, uh, people respect that. I've noticed that a lot. So I just, I just write down or I'll just say, you know, I'm really uncomfortable. Let's, let me think about that. I'll get back to you tomorrow. I think that's really a, a really key thing as well. I don't think we, we, we feel like we have to respond to everything immediately. And sometimes we just need some time. We need some time in the in the more quiet stillness moments to, to process that. And so I love that, just saying, hey, look, it makes me uncomfortable. But I think as long as you set a, a time frame around it as well, like let's get back tomorrow and talk about that. Um, just saying I don't want to talk about no. it and just leaving it doesn't no. help. But if you can say, hey, let's come back. Oh, tomorrow. I get accused at home. Yeah. My wife will look at me. What, what's going on with you? It's like... I'm just processing, sorry. <laughs> I may have some weird look on my face. I have no idea what my facial cues are, but yeah, I do. I found myself, I really now, I have much heavier processor than I used to be because I really want to understand all angles of these things that whatever they are that come up. And I love the idea of reviewing your day and actually writing down what did make you feel uncomfortable and, and keeping, you know, just checking in, isn't it, on what is actually going on for you and why, why that's happening. Yeah, yeah. No, it's been, it's been a game changer. Okay. Perfect. Now, I know that technology is the natural kind of third one, but I want to talk a little bit about gratitude yeah. first because I think it's a natural kind of um, segue into gratitude. So tell me what you mean by that. I mean, I think it's a word that tends to get a little bit overused, but I'm a big believer that, you know, be in the moment, be grateful for what you have. But how do you yeah. translate that in uh, For me, it's a, there's a faith component there. So I like to start the day out uh, with prayer, um, and uh, I like to get out, like I said, get outside and I just get into get into nature or get, go and work out and just um, just kind of um, just think about, gosh, I have a you know, I have a family, I have a business, I have my health. I, I, I do some deep breathing and I like I can I can actually thankful for my breath today um, that I can breathe. Um, and then when you just start with those things, um, then. It, it just kind of naturally for me, it just kind of goes, okay, I need to, now I need to pray for others, you know, who's hurting out there is, or who can I pray for in my family or who at work is, you know, going through a tough situation that I know of, or, Hey, we got some big decisions we need to make today. I need to, I need to absolutely pray, pray about that. But having that heart, just stopping and just being thankful, just taking two, just 30 seconds or a minute um, at the most every morning, just waking up and saying, all right, there's another day. I need to, I'm going to come clean. Here we go. We're going to start for the day. So that's really what, yeah. to me, that's just starting the day out the right way makes all the difference. I completely agree. I actually have a journal and I just, you know, the three things I'm grateful for and the three things I'm most excited about today too. And it's that whole starting on a, a positive, well, not, not fakely positive, but, you know, and being grateful for what you actually have rather than worrying about what you don't have. Exactly, exactly. 
yeah. Okay, okay let's let's move on to technology then now because I was just thinking I, I actually write on my in my remarkable every day when I do my gratitude journal. But what do you mean by technology? So we talked about people, process, technology in that order. Right. I mean there's so much technology that we we are being thrust upon us. Um, even at, from a company standpoint, we're putting in a new laboratory information management system. We tried to buy one from the shelf. We're actually in year three of building our own with the company. Um, it's going to be fantastic once we get it all in place. Um, this new, we're going to move to a new campus. So there's all kinds of innovation there. Innovation is wonderful. There's an investment with it. Um, we're finding new ways to do testing, uh, analysis. Um, I don't know. And, and there's, there's technology like chat GB, GPT or, uh, AI. I mean, there's, there's different things. But again, I think it really, it's, it's for me, it used to be number one. Like I, I want to be on the latest iPhone. I want to be on the latest technology. Um, what I've learned is, you know what, get, get right with your people, make sure that you have some processes that you really want to work on or you want to improve. And then you'll find the technology to do it. Let technology to address those first two. Um, and you'll go much further than, oh, I got to have a late, I got to do something in AI tomorrow. I mean, think about that. What, what are you going to do? What am I, what would I do tomorrow? Or I don't know that, but that used to be my driver was all, I want to be on the latest technology, um, whether it's web or I don't know, in marketing, whether it's something in marketing, I wanted to be on the, I wanted to be on the cutting edge of all that stuff, but I've kind of learned yeah. now to go, if you do this other thing, you'll go further I, and faster. I think. Yeah. It should be an enabler rather right. than a driver, right. right? It's like you've got your people and they're doing what they love and they're kind of working in their God-given talent of an area. Um, and you've got your processes, then you look at the technology and go, how can that help yeah, that? Exactly. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Now I'm going to go back to the book again. So, um, you know, leaders look within. You talked about, you know, finding your why, being healthy and having gratitude. I, I don't know about you, but I do worry that sometimes leaders kind of feel they have to be something or they need, you know, this is what is expected of a leader. Um, how do you go about really looking within and going, you know, what is my why? Why am I doing this? Rather than being led by what everybody tells you. you exactly. Should. No. And I, I will tell you that for years I did not have a why. I mean, it was actually, it was actually Dana that she talked for two and a half hours with me. What's your why? And I couldn't answer yeah. a question. I just didn't have it. Or even today, she'll challenge me. Is that really what you want? Is that coming from the, you know, is that coming from your heart or is that, are you just trying to rationalize things? And I, um, and I think that's so true. I think as leaders, we just try to, we think that we have to analyze or rationalize or justify, but what's really in our heart. And once we, once we really figure out what's here, we can make the other things work. It is really crazy. But I really do believe that. And you can do some amazing things, but it's got to come from here. I can do all the rationalizing, analyzing, and I've done that my, pretty much for a lot. You can spend a lot of time there. Where are you going to spend your time and energy? What do you really want? And what's going to be a most value? And usually it comes here. If it's coming from up there, it's going to probably not last or it's going to feel a little funny or you're going to justify with number. I don't know. I just really think... I think everyone has something, but it takes a while. It does take a bit to unlock it. I will say that. I don't think everyone has that. I know everyone here does not have a why. They just come to work. Yeah. They do their job. They go home. I used to be that way for years. So I, to your point, I don't think, I think you really have to own it and want it. If you really want to discover who you are or you really want to be, you want to grow at another level. And it's not for everyone. Not everyone needs to, wants to be a leader. Some people are very happy with doing those things, doing, doing what they need to do. But if you want to lead something or you want to lead an initiative or you want to make a difference, then you got to really find what's in, in your heart. And then you got to listen to that and then really test that out and see, is that, is that really what you believe? And if it is, you'll follow your, you'll follow it. And I think it takes a certain maturity as well to get to that point where you're happy to do that. I know that um, for many, many years in my sort of 20s and 30s, I did what I thought was right. I did what I thought my, what my parents wanted me to do. I did what um, everybody told me I should do. I did what my MBA told me I should do. Um, and it was only sort of later on in life I actually went, actually, 
what you know I think actually sadly it was the passing of my brother that was kind of the, the moment for me it was like wow life really is too short and am I really doing what I love and am I actually you know do I am I making time to do other things outside of work and it was just a bit of a wake-up call and I started thinking about what is my real purpose here why why am I on this planet you you sum that up beautifully you really do you really live for others and I did that a lot too I think that was my whole life oh I'm doing what is expected I others are expecting of me I'm doing what this person thinks I should be doing your mom, your dad, your, your uh, yeah. manager, whatever. I think that fed beautifully sums up when you don't have your own wire purpose or mm. that's, that's usually what happens. It is true. You're living somebody exactly. else's life. Yeah. Exactly. <laughs> yeah. Life is, and life yeah. is too short. <laughs> yeah. Um, I, gosh, I had a question that just completely out of my head then. Oh, it's about the family business again. It was like, so I'm in the beginning, you talked about the fact that you had another partner in the business with your father. And so there was three of their, was it their sons that were working in the yeah, business or were, three of the family that were working were in the two, business? My dad had two other partners and they both, they had sons yep. in the business at one time or another. Um, yep. and so I think at one time they thought there were three families were going to run the business. So, um, mm-hmm. yeah, no, I, I, that's re- that's how it was for years. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And so you've you've talked about the fact you'd love to take it down to the next generation. I was just actually talking with a family business that's into their fourth generation the other day, which is really fantastic. But there's got to be a desire to actually work in the business, right? Because if you do, if you just go into it because that's what's expected, you're doing exactly what we just talked about. You're doing what you think you should, as opposed to what you genuinely want to do. Um, I wonder, um, you've got children that you think might want to come into the business. Are, how do you, yeah. how would that work out do you think? Um, and so my kids are uh, from 21 to 27 i have five children two boys and three girls um yep you know i wasn't i was 40 when i came back to the company so um and the same thing my kids are all of college they're all pursuing their dreams which they have to do you have to let them pursue their mm-hmm. dreams um, my kids could not be more different i have an attorney i have a dancer i have a one that's in formation to be a priest. I have a marketing person and I have a teacher. I mean, they're, they're yeah. all over the place. They're all very close. Uh, but again, they have to find, they have to figure out who they are. And what I love that I keep trying to instill in them, they all have that entrepreneurial spirit. I want them to have that. Mm-hmm. I think when I was growing up, I was more like, oh, don't do this. This is too scary. My dad worked many, many hours and he'd come home late yeah. and he said, you don't want to do this for your family. I mean, he, he would say those things. So I kind of grew up with that, that, that kind of um, way. But, um, and then as I got older, things, maybe you're ready, you know, maybe you're, it's, you're ready to do these things. But I think it's really important we really stir that into our, or, and teach that and coach that in our kids that they can make a difference, that they can uh, do these things so that they, again, mm-hmm. find out, one, who they are and then what they can do and, how they can make a difference. Absolutely. I think that's really important. Do I think any of them will come back? I, I don't know. I don't know the answer, but at the same time, what I want to do is put processes, put things in place. So if something happens to me tomorrow, the company still continues. And I think I'm always working on that. I don't think you're ever done working on that till you, till you pass away. So I think that's just a work in process every single day. Yeah. Uh, and I, th- I love the fact that, you know, you're allowing the, the kids to go off and do what they want to do. And then if they want to come back, then that's absolutely fantastic. But at the same time, let them discover. And I think um, I'm really grateful. I had a lot of different jobs in my early days, which really exposed me to a lot of different things, which means I could then decide what really made my heart sing and what, what didn't. So, yeah, it's important to have that opportunity to explore. Yeah, no, I couldn't agree more. Couldn't agree more. Okay, so we're coming to the end of the, the podcast, sadly, but I always ask my guests to give you know the listeners three things they could actually take away and hopefully put into action or, or do in the next sort of, you know, few days. What what would you say? Okay, Ed? first I would say self care is not selfish. You should do it. You should. You really need to do something. Um, get look at you, look at what you're currently doing and find ways to improve yourself because your your people, whoever your lead, especially leaders. They see it in you. I mean, I have to bring my A game every single day. If I show, show a frown or I show any kind of questioning, people see it. So I really want to yeah. show that it's positive, that the company's moving forward. And it takes work and you got to work at it. And that's self care. So take some time for you, build yourself up. Um, second, I would say 
I think for me, the biggest part is calling people by the name. It sounds so simple, but when you call someone by their name, you got their attention. They really, it shows that you care. And it's really been a game changer for me. So I try constantly to learn people's names. I still do a bad job at that at times. Uh, but I think what, even with COVID, when we were wearing masks, I didn't do that. And I really lost about two years and I'm coming back to doing that. And people see it when they hear their name and uh, or and yourself when you hear your own name sometimes you could go a whole day and never hear your name think about the uh, the power of that and then finally i would say uh selfishly read the book if you want an example again of someone who's gone through this this is not a self-help book this is not a 10-step book how to be a, bit, a good leader this is what happened to me and maybe there's a piece in there that will resonate with you and that or as the reader and that's really my goal i just want everyone to find what's in their heart and hopefully live a life of gratitude because it's so transforming it's so powerful there's so much energy in it and that's really my hope in reading the book that you just see someone who who gives examples and again maybe one of those resonates with you but i'm not here to tell you what to do i'm not here to tell you how to be a good leader you got to find that yourself that's the premise of the book. You have to find that, own it yourself. Yeah. And so if, if people want to get hold of that book, ceoofyourheart.com is where you will find um, all the information about Brent and also with the way you can find the book as well. Um, sadly, I have not had a chance to read it before we got to talk, but I'm um, definitely feeling inclined to add that to my thousands of books, that, as you said. Um, just a little a little snippet here. When Before we got onto the podcast, I actually spoke with Brent and he said he's got thousands of books and they're also colour-coded. Do you want to tell us a little bit about that? Yeah, before you leave I us? saw this. Again, I, saw, I love coffee shops. I saw this at a coffee shop. Yeah. And they were all color coded and um, it made such an impact. I went home and I rearranged my books and my wife looks at me and goes, are you turning into a millennial or what? And I thought, yes, I like that. I will take that compliment. You know what? And it's so yeah. cool. And then you'll realize how many black books and red books and green books you have. It's I, wow. I thought it was great. I'd never thought about doing that. Yeah. <laughs> Cause I must admit, I do. I love my books. I, I, I really enjoy my Kindle in terms of being able to travel and read lots of different books at the same time, but there's nothing quite beats like an actual hard copy of a book where you can hold it in your hands and, and write on it. I know that's not good for <laughs> books, but I love it. <laughs> Brent, it's been an absolute pleasure. I've really enjoyed our talk. If people would like to get hold of you, how would they best you know, do that? Uh, you sit at the CEO of your heart.com. Um, absolutely. Mm -hmm. You can find me on LinkedIn, um, Brent Pullman, uh, Facebook, Instagram. Um, I, I do bring a faith component leadership message every single day. Uh, that's just part of my daily routine, but absolutely you can connect on me and all those social media platforms and no, thank you so much for letting me talk about oh, no, this. Thank you. I, I, I... I always, um, I mean, I do these podcasts obviously to help other people, but I always get so much value out of them myself. So, so thank you for being so open, so honest, for sharing your your tips and techniques and, and just your journey. I think it's fantastic to hear. Oh, thank thank you. you. Thank you again, Deborah. It's been great. My absolute pleasure.